I'd like to start off by saying thank you for coming today. And uh, for the first feature of the post Tom Meets York Seminar Series, uh, we're going to be um, hosting Professor Paul Pettit, a specialist of the Middle and Upper Paleolithic, working at the University of Durham. So I would first like to ask, do you remember if anything in particular first drew you to study this sort of time period, or has it just always been something that you were interested in? I do remember, and it hasn't always been something I've always been interested in at all. I was vaguely interested in the past as a school kid, although I'd be lying if I said I always had a passion in it and as a schoolboy, dug at weekends or anything like that. Yeah. Um, but to cut a long story short, I developed an idea of being a Roman specialist. Really? Mm. And I worked actually before I went to university for the then Chichester Archaeological Unit, and we largely dug Roman as you can imagine. Yeah. And uh, yet, there was this site up the road called Boxgrove. Um, and every year our unit had to produce a, an annual report and we'd get a little one-page report from Boxgrove and it always struck me as glamorously exciting. All of these names of rodents and animals and weird concepts like soil taphonomy and this sort of yeah. thing, you know. So it always struck me as quite a glamorous kind of field, very old human evolution and so on. So I went to university expecting to, well, train as a, uh, as a Roman specialist. And actually, if I can say, we, we had quite a boring lecture in Roman history. Yeah. It was temporary. <laughs> <laughs> and I won't obviously mention who it is. Yeah. But yeah, how do you make Roman history boring? But he did. <laughs> uh, but we did have a very good Roman archaeologist, I hasten to add. Uh, yeah. But um, I had a very fun and exciting prehistorian as a personal tutor. He was a late, later prehistorian, though, the, the late Lawrence Barfield. And a combination of these factors meant I found myself departing from an interest in Roman archaeology and back into prehistory, and then uh, eventually back through later prehistory, <laughs> where I bumped into the Paleolithic, and that was it. It's a big turnaround, isn't it? It's an extremely big one, <laughs> yeah. and, you know, I'd never, of course, have predicted it, uh, and so on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I was wondering um, if during your research, you've obviously studied several areas of early humans and Neanderthal behaviour from art expressions and funerary practices, um, but also Paleolithic chronometry, and I was wondering if you could explain to me what that was exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it means uh, the practice of dating things, uh, in, this, in this case, Paleolithic. Um, so, obviously, in the Paleolithic, we're extremely dependent on being able to date sites accurately, uh, accurately and, and as precisely as possible. Yeah. And uh, it's something I guess we all take for granted uh, and so on, and something I didn't really think about until as a PhD student I got a job uh, as the kind of in-house archaeologist for the Oxford Radiocarbon Lab. Okay. So, uh, in the sort of week I had before the interview there, I had to really cram up on radiocarbon dating and, and I spent six years with them and, uh, you know, working with hard scientists, physicists, yeah. chemists, chemists working on radiocarbon. So I learnt a lot uh, about the limitations of dating, the possibilities, how not to use dates and so on. So it's something I've retained uh, ever since really and things are never really as they seem. Uh, with what otherwise look like straightforward dates, uh, yeah. you know. So um, I think there is, there is a respectable field. You call it chronometry, yeah. uh, if you like, you know. But um, uh, the, the working out what the limitations of our date data sets are. And obviously, the further you go back, the more difficult it is to pinpoint the date, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. The the less precise yeah. uh, our dates become, in other words, the bigger the ranges are. But even in areas where we think it's all done and dusted and uh, you know that there's still lots of potential pitfalls for example the middle to upper Paleolithic transition yeah. or to put it another way Neanderthal extinction and dispersal of our own species is is really predicated upon uh, an understanding of big radiocarbon data sets and there are all sorts of problems yeah. which beset yeah, you know even this relatively recent field in which dates are quite precise yeah definitely um, I was going to ask you um, a question about the Cresswell Crags Caves, um, which in 2003 you co-discovered. Um, 
I was wondering if there were a list of indicators or sort of ideas that you had in mind when you found the cave or whether it was sort of a process, like what was the process of finding the cave art? Mm, yeah, it, it was the cave art, not, not the caves uh, uh, that, that we discovered. The caves uh, were one of the first exploited for their archaeological potential in the 19th century. And actually, um, this came about when I was based at Oxford and I invited Paul Barn. Uh, to one of our kind of formal dinners, I think it was called a feast. You know, at my college you're supposed to take somebody important who could either be prestigious or donate lots of money to the college. You know, Paul, I felt prestigious enough. Yeah. We shortly, shortly beforehand become friends when Paul got in touch with me asking me my opinion about the radio carbon dates for the art of the Grotte Chauvet uh, in France that yeah. we both have considerable problems with and uh, we shortly became friends. I invited Paul to this dinner and over the course of a fairly boozy evening, in my case Paul doesn't drink, uh, you know Paul said I'd love to search for cave art in Britain but I wouldn't know where to start and I said well I would. So I put together a four day tour if you like uh, which took us to the places that I thought it were more likely if we're going to find art uh, we would find it at Cresswell Crags um, was first on the list and we looked uh, in the three major caves of the north side of the gorge, that's Pinhole, Robin Hood Cave and Mother Grundy's Parlour, uh, we found you know, in one set of engravings in Robin Hood Cave, we found possible engravings in Mother Grundy's Parlour, but I wasn't going to take us into Churchill uh, until, you know, we were push for time, we had to set off for Paviland in Wales that, yeah. later that day, uh, until one of the regulars, now retired, uh, Brian, said, go on, have a quick look in, in Churchill before you go, and I said, okay. Yeah. So we did, and that's where we, we found it all, so to the everlasting credit uh, so quite of Brian chance. Chambers. Yeah, it, yeah. It, yeah, absolutely, so, you know, I, had I been a betting man, it's about the only vice I don't have, uh, I, would, I would never have betted on finding anything, you know, it was, it was remarkably lucky. Um, so uh, that was that, yeah. Do you think that it's um, an isolated example, or do you think that there's more around Britain to be found? Well, certainly it would be nice to think there's more, and indeed since then, since, well, certainly since 2004, Paul and I have been looking uh, in other caves, and that uh, still goes on, uh, albeit infrequently. We've not found anything. Claims have been made for an engraved mammoth in Goff's Cave in, in Cheddar Gorge. That's entirely natural. Yeah. Claims have been made for an engraved animal, question mark, reindeer in Cathole in Wales. That's an engraving, but almost certainly far younger than... The Paleolithic, so there's nothing convincing yet, and uh, you know, one finds from time to time marks that look like they could be engraved, but carnivores can be irritating little critters and leave, you know, what look like um, uh, engraved marks. So, in short, I mean, it's always difficult to answer that sort of question sensibly, but I'd like to think there will probably be scrappy bits more. One really gets the impression that when you get out of the heartland, uh, of Upper Paleolithic art, in Europe at least, uh, it becomes far less uh, common. But that having been said, they've just found some open air Paleolithic engravings in Germany. Oh, so, really? you know, so um, th there's always a surprise out there. And as you will see, uh, tomorrow um, in the journal Nature, similarly aged cave art has just been found in Sulawesi uh, in East Asia and dated very well. So. There's always a surprise there, but yeah. in Britain, I think, it's so far to the north of the, the occupied Paleolithic world that humans are hardly here. So, you know, when they're here, they're here in small numbers, and are probably preoccupied with other things than, yeah. than, you know, doing their rituals in deep caves and leaving art in them. So the search continues. It does, yeah. indeed, and I have to say it's good fun doing it anyway, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was going to ask a question on, you've, you've studied the, um, the Neanderthals' extinction, and I was wondering what from your research, do you believe the reason this, of this, is it sort of humans, um, are we the reason for their demise? I think it would be fair to say uh, that the answer to that is almost certainly no. Now, um, 
I mean, a lot of other people have done far more work on the chronometry uh, of, of Neanderthal extinction and, and our own dispersal in Paleolithic Europe the, than I have. And on the basis of quite a large data set uh, that we have now, I think it's fair to say that pretty much everywhere Neanderthals become extinct before the arrival of our own species. Certainly there's no evidence of any plausible overlap, at least of any appreciable period of time. And I don't think really one can argue on a stratigraphic basis that we turn up in a given area and bang, Neanderthals go, you know, pretty quickly. So I think that will be unlikely. So it seems that Neanderthals, for whatever reason Neanderthals became extinct, it didn't involve our own species. Don't ask me what those other reasons uh, for the actual <laughs> extinctions could be. Well, you know, if you, if you look at it in a very broad uh, sense, Neanderthal have, Neanderthals have their heyday, um, let's say for the sake of argument, between about 75 and 120,000 years ago. There are relatively large numbers of sites, relatively large numbers of Neanderthals in Europe and so on, and, and from that point, uh, you know, there's a gradual decline. Uh, if you look in the climatic context, climate is remarkably unstable, you know, it shakes them up and so on. And, um, and then we come into an extremely cold and unstable period approaching 40,000 years ago in which a lot of animals, big animals, become extinct, like certain rhinos and this sort of thing. Yeah. So we have a context for it. You know, Neanderthals are big animals, yeah. partially big woolly animals that, that become extinct as well. So presumably climate and the resulting shaking up of ecosystems and so on is probably a little too fragile for yeah. them. So I'd never look at, at one cause, it's probably this interrelated thing. But, and, and possibly as a sobering thought, given that we seem to appear uh, after Neanderthals become extinct in each region, and given that, say, as Joao Zilau has suggested, in Iberia, you know, we only make it to the north of Iberia relatively early. Neanderthals persist in the south, and it's only when they disappear later do we go south. You could actually argue that there's some limitation on our own abilities to disperse, and that what we are doing really is occupying a, a kind of recently vacated ecological niche. Really? You know, so uh, rather like carnivores and early humans, you know, when the big carnivores go, life becomes a little easier in Europe for Heidelbergensis or Antecessor or whatever you want to call them. Uh, maybe you get a similar situation with sapiens and the Amstelensis. So they're like the dominant species and we've moved in, possibly. Yeah, I mean, one thing the last few years is telling us is that, of course, Neanderthals had cognitive and behavioural capacities that were far closer to ours. Yeah. Uh, than we've hitherto given them credit for. And of course, they are the indigenous U human, uh, European humans. Yeah. Uh, of course, they're going to have an intimately expert knowledge of these difficult landscapes. So surely the default argument must be that they knew what they were doing. Yeah. And although it would be a little trite to suggest that we didn't, as we kind of tap danced across yeah. Europe, painting our caves yeah. and all this sort of thing, <laughs> you know, that, that there, is, there is a reality to that, that, you know, the Neanderthals were survivors. Uh, they were tough. And there's no reason, I think, to suppose that we had some kind of odd adaptive advantage. advantage. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Neanderthals have suffered a lot from bad press, haven't they, recently? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so again with the Neanderthals, it's been recently, analysis has suggested that on average um, Europeans have about 6% of their DNA. So do you think that it's likely that there was much interbreeding between the two species? <laughs> there's no evidence, well there's no direct evidence, of course, well I suppose direct evidence of interbreeding would <laughs> involve a, a keyhole in a bedroom and a <laughs> Neanderthal and a modern human. But there's no, I think, compelling, strong indirect evidence for any kind uh, of um, breeding or successful breeding and so on. I mean, there's two issues here, I suppose. There's did two ever make love, so to speak, and if they did, did they produce a viable offspring? We certainly know the latter isn't the case. That there's no obviously known Neanderthal modern hybrid yeah. uh, around. Um, there's the Lagavello child from Portugal, of course. It has been suggested that some of that child's anatomical traits 
I shared with Neanderthals, but then again, some of the Inuit traits, uh, like hyperarctic body proportions, one could say are shared with the Neanderthals. So, you know, this can all be explained in terms of convergent evolution and, you know, okay. kids adapting biologically still to cold environments, rather like Neanderthals did. So when you, you look critically at all of that, there's no, uh, there's no compelling evidence whatsoever. Uh, so it comes down to DNA. And I'm not, not the person to discuss about it. I find DNA in, unintelligible. Uh, I certainly find most of the publications <laughs> unintelligible. And, you know, the Neanderthal genome, you know, 6% of our DNA shared. I mean, what does that mean? You know, we, we share, you know, what is it, 54% with a, a banana, you know, 25% with a daffodil. It doesn't make us quarter daffodil or something like that. So I don't really understand the implications of that and the suggestion, as I remember, uh, with the G Neanderthal Genome Project, is that the overlap, as it were, was likely to have occurred in the Near East, where I think, which I think is by far the most implausible area, where this could have happened. Either our archaeological record is seriously wrong, and it's a pretty respectable one from the Near East. Yeah. So either that, or there's something wrong with the, with the interpretation of the ancient DNA and you know I can't my suspicions are it's the latter uh, I'll go out on a limb and say uh, I'm really not qualified to uh, to judge but it seems to me that there are ten, well, certainly 10,000 years of distinct gap in the Near East between the evidence for our own occupation say Skahul and Kaf say arguably down to 90,000 possibly even older and the earliest Neanderthals, say Shanidar, around 75, or something like that, you know. Either that gap is not real, and we've yet to sample, but we have lots of stratigraphic sequences, or, you know, th the they're just not around. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, unless it's the odd holiday maker. You know, <laughs> the odd Homo sapiens holidaying from Egypt <laughs> and Neanderthals from, you know, the Balkans or something <laughs> like that, then I, I find it very unlikely. Okay. Um. Based upon the evidence, scanty as it may be, of the behaviour of the two species, if you were to meet either of them, which do you think would be the most affable to get along with? <laughs> <laughs> well, people have... <laughs> you know, Clive Gangles suggested, you know, in this anthropological language that you, know, you can have open and closed societies uh, and uh, open societies are the ones who wear you know similar clothing and decorative items that whenever we see each other even if we don't know each other's names or whatever we know we're broadly singing yeah. from the same song sheet or I suppose I should say piping with the same mammoth <laughs> bone flute or something like that but um, and, and by the implication it could be argued that Neanderthal societies were relatively closed in other words they didn't recognize strangers and this sort of thing I mean it's speculative um, of course I think to be quite honest with you the Florowit of art and all these wonderful things that we like looking at in coffee table books, uh, you know, Lascaux art and uh, all this sort of thing, ivory carvings and, and so on, belies the fact that human societies are, are rarely pleasant. And I'm sure if you go back to the Magdalenian or the Brevetian or the Aurignacian or the Mysterian, depending on which species you want to talk about, you, you won't find, you know, people who get up, shake your hand and say, join us in the campfire. You know, we were just having a gossip. Yeah. You know, this sort of thing. I th it's a tough world out there. Uh, there's evidence for, you know, there is evidence for violence. You know, it's remarkably different, uh, a, a world. Yeah. And it's probably not a world, as I say, that they would have said, who's this weird guy, uh, you know, from Durham University coming here, let's, let's give him some reindeer steak <laughs> and, and, and find out a bit more about, about him. I think yeah. it would probably be, you know, shoot first, uh, ask questions later. Yeah. So if I had to choose, obviously, I, I'd choose uh, Cro-Magnon. I'd choose to die at the hands of Cro-Magnons <laughs> <laughs> because I could at least see them doing their art <laughs> in context and probably find out from now they were going to bury me. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, Next, I was wondering if you would mind giving us a bit of an exclusive and telling us a little bit about any current research you were doing. Uh, yes, certainly. Well, other than um, developing my kind of ideas about long-term human mortuary activity, how our treatment of the dead 
begins and unfolds. That's an ongoing one. Largely, I suppose, the thing that's most sort of to the forefront is working with colleagues on dating. Okay, like that. That's particularly Alistair Pike at Southampton, who does you series dating, uh, Joao Zilao uh, at Barcelona, and um, Marcos uh, Garcia Diaz from the University of Pays Basque. So we form a, a core of a team which are using Uranium series dating uh, to date stalactites that have grown over art, in other words, to produce oh, wow. maximum age. We think for a variety of reasons it's the most reliable uh, technique, if relatively imprecise, it's accurate in terms of providing minimum ages, but otherwise imprecise. Well, we think it's the most um, reliable. So we, uh, we've already published some preliminary results which have pushed back art. And uh, we're starting, we think, to get a general pattern of how art develops with a kind of non-figurative phase first and then, a, then figurative art coming in. So we've got uh, a grant for the next one, well, I suppose, two and a half years now. We're in half a year into a three-year project in which we're looking at caves, a number of caves in Spain, France, and we hope Italy uh, as well to, to really bombard that. Wow. Yeah. So that's, I guess, what I'm more preoccupied with at the moment. That would be really good to get some sort of, at least minimum dates for the album. Absolutely, yeah. 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 Excellent. Um, if you were given the chance to excavate on any archaeological site in the world, from the present day or the past, where would it be and why? <laughs> Pompeii? <laughs> something with loads of gold or something like that? No, being serious, if it had to be Paleolithic, wow. Here's a broad question, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think it would be in a cave, and it would be in a cave with lots and lots of art, because, you know, we know... I'd have to say, I'd be lying if I said to you that it had to be serious research questions, obviously. You know, I, I love the idea of digging somewhere like your Tuk Doda Bear or Lasco <laughs> or something like that, you know. But there is a serious issue in that we often don't really have much of an idea what has gone on that is reflected archaeologically in the sediments of wonderful sanctuaries, if you want to call them that, uh, and so on. So, and, and you know, that's, that's something that's close to my heart, putting, putting these two things together, what's on the walls, what's been going on. Uh, in various places in the caves. So, inevitably, I'm going to say Altamira, I think, as there's tons of sediments there yeah. still. You know, it's such a wonderful cave art site. It's, it's one I've been privileged to, to work in uh, and so on. And it's Spain, and you can come yeah. out <laughs> and have seafood and Spanish wine. <laughs> so, Altamira. <laughs> Altamira, okay. <laughs> Actually, I was wondering if I could ask, why do you, what do you think drew our ancestors to produce art in the caves? Like, are there any sort of theories that might explain that? There's, there's, there's far too many theories, I'm afraid. And they're, 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 they all share one, one thing, and that is they generalise from nothing and therefore probably have very little explanatory power. Uh, I think one thing we can say is that in deep caves where you're out of the daylight zone, you're not there for any reasons of survival or anything like that. You're not there to hunt animals, to gather whatever vegetable food stuff is around and so on. So you're in there for the purpose of exploring the cave and presumably undertaking rituals or, or whatever. So I should imagine, and I don't think it's too far-fetched to say, that art was produced in the context of other activities that took people into deep caves and they were almost certainly related to exploration to weird concepts about what caves are uh, and to the resulting rituals and this sort of thing. But often we think that it was actually the act of depicting things or leaving symbols on the walls that was important rather than the as we were uh, right exactly yeah. rather than this rather modern concept of a like, fancy painting a bull, you yeah. know, and mm, that's nice, you know, and this sort of thing. So it's presumably extremely ritualised. It's probably very difficult to understand from our own preconditions, even from a modern anthropological precondition. Yeah. Uh, it, it's probably very weird, I should think. And of course, 
probably lots and lots of different reasons, and we're dealing with 25,000 years yeah. of art, presumably, that, you know, that differ over time. So a sort of process of going down there into these really hard to reach, sort of dangerous places, and the process of putting it on the walls in the first place? Yes, absolutely. It's partially exploration. Uh, it's partially an, uh, an interaction with the topography of the cave in this weird low-light situation. Yeah. Um, a movement of things around, often animal bones from the floors being wedged into cracks. And, you know, one gets the impression that they really are scrutinising, you know, almost myopically. You know, yeah. this, this really isn't a sort of look around and, and so on. So they're, they're using all of the senses. They're presumably ascribing meaning to everything they experience weird sounds in the distance. And the sensory deprivation as well produced some pretty Absolutely. weird sort of hallucinogenic sort of... Well, I wouldn't go that far. Not it, it's, yeah, it, it certainly alters yeah. the senses yeah. it, it, and it is a peculiar um, sensation. Yeah. And, and of course one would have to say unique from a Paleolithic perspective where normally everything one does is outside and you know uh, uh, so a, a completely different way so it's understandable that these are thought to be and remain to be thought to be weird places where this world uh, meets others I, I think it's obvious that it must you know relate to this in some way but art is just a little bit of it and we have to remember 95% of cave art is simple engravings that are very difficult to see, you know, and the, the Lascaux are, are extremely rare. Yeah. Okay, and a final question. If you were to spend a day adventure seeking with Indiana Jones, what three items would you take to guarantee your survival? What was his female companion called? <laughs> Uh, there were several. <laughs> <laughs> and does this include Indiana Jones, or does he have to be one of my three? I suppose it could do. I think it was if you were with him. So. Okay, so he's there because he's got the gun, so that's good. Just His female <laughs> <laughs> um, Yeah, to, to ensure survival otherwise, uh, probably a Kit Kat. <laughs> and um, we'll have water, won't we? There'll be a river water. or something like that, or he'll be able to find it and yeah. that sort of thing. So, a last thing, I don't know. It's a weird one, that's survival. You see, I'd be useless, but then I'm not Paleolithic. So. <laughs> Well, thank you very, very much for agreeing to come along. And um, as promised, here are your smarties. Brilliant, thank you. There better be some blue ones in there. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>